I am confident and convinced that architects, they need to rise up and really wake up to their value and their importance in society. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and in today's show, I sit down with Mark LePage of Entre Architect. Mark recently interviewed me for his podcast, and we dive into topics such as the value of an architect, what the future may be like in the industry, as well as the changes that we've seen in architecture, especially relating to small firms in the past decade. So with that, buckle your seatbelt, and here is my interview with Mark R. LePage of Entre Architect. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Enix Sears, welcome back to Entree Architect Podcast. Hey, Mark. Good to be here. So glad to to come on again and speak with you. I'm excited about this. You've been on the show a couple of times way back when I first launched back in, I think you, the first time you were on the show was 2014, I think, a couple of years after we both launched our our platforms, um, which that's part of what I wanted to talk about here today. Um, You and I have been friends for a long time, have been allies for a long time. Uh, We started at the same time. 2012, we both launched uh, our platforms, you at the Business of Architecture, me at Entree Architect. Um, Very similar um, uh, mission, very similar vision, uh, doing different things for different people, but very much aligned with wanting to help the profession grow uh, and be more successful. And so what I want to do today, Enoch, is maybe talk a little bit about what we've seen and what we've discovered in the past 10 years, what the profession has looked like, what's changed in the last 10 years. There's a lot of change in the past 10 years. Um, And then maybe talk a little bit about what's happening today and then maybe peek at the future. What do you think about that? That sounds like great, Mark. I'd love to talk about that. You know, you and I, we've been on the scene here in what we might call the training, coaching, educational space in terms of the business side of architecture for over a decade. Um, and I know there, there are other consulting and other companies out there that have been in the, this space even longer than we have, you know, 10, 30, 40 years. Um, so there's certainly been a lot of change in the, in the space, and there's been a lot of change in what I've seen. And probably one of the biggest shifts that I've seen over the past 10 years is the younger architectural practice owners. So the younger people who are coming up in the profession, they seem to be a lot more, and this makes sense, but they're a lot more savvy with digital tools. Mm-hmm. That, and when I say digital tools, I don't just mean the production tools that we might use to produce drawings like Revit. And, um, I'm referring to social media content, video content, thought leadership content. And so it's very interesting to see this kind of rift in the, the way that architectural practices are run. So I see there's like a rift between like the older generation of practices that were more established, maybe firms that were founded in the early 90s, even firm. Well, probably that probably that's kind of the cutoff. Like sometime in the 90s, right. these firms very much represent uh, just an older school way of doing things, you know, and that older school way w- uh, would look like, um, you know, it's common for us to hear these 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 uh, very mature firm owners who've been doing this for a long time. And my hat is off to them for the effort, the skills the experience, what they've done to build their practices. Um, but we, we hear a lot of times, you know, when, when we're in confidential spaces, of course, you know, man, these, I don't understand my, my younger employees. They just, you know, it seems like they feel like they're owed everything. You know, they, they, they hop off during the middle of the day to go buy shoes and they don't even tell me. I, I mean, I told them we have a flexible work environment, but I'd appreciate at least being let know that they were going to talk, you know, head off yeah. and go buy some shoes or they're coming to me and they're saying, Hey, we want to have Friday afternoons off. 
And so we get them Friday new afternoons off and we're hoping that will increase productivity and it finds out that it decreases it. So there's, there, there's, there's just a cultural riff there between uh, firms that were founded previously and then the way that they perceive younger architects who are younger in the profession. But one thing I do see about the younger architects in the profession is that they, they do have, they do have different cultural values in terms of how much they want to work and, and balance that or synchronize that with their personal life. They may have other interests. Uh, a lot of them aren't just all about architecture. They, right. They're like, Hey, I want it time for family. This is kind of have my architecture box over here and I have this over here. So to summarize, you know, as these firms become older and there's a lot of ownership transition coming along, we're seeing a new generation of firms coming up that have a very different approach to how they market, a different approach to how they lead, a different approach, how they want to run their cultures. Because even like I look at my parents and I think, you know, when I was a teenager, Mark, uh, maybe it wasn't this way for you, but I was like, I'm going to do all these things differently. Like I'm seeing all yeah. the flaws of my parents. And when I have my own family, it's going to be this, this, and this. And we do the same thing, you know, with our employers, we, we can easily see all their faults and think that, you know, it's so much easier and we'll do it differently. And so it does feel like over time, things are, I would say things are positively moving in the right direction to keep up with the changes that are happening in the larger world. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree that we are improving. The profession is growing and becoming more successful, more valued. Um, and I, and I agree with you about the younger generation, um, doing things differently and, you know, my generation, you're a little bit younger than me, but my generation is the transition generation. You know, when I started the profession, it was on a drafting board. I'm not sure about you, but, but there was no computers in the, my first office. Um, it came, the computer came after I came to that job. Right. And so we went from the drafting board to the workstation. Um, there was no internet when I first started. Well, there was internet, but it wasn't being used in the profession. Uh, th so the internet is something that has significantly changed and the generation that you're talking about are, are technology natives, right? Internet natives. They were born with iPads in their hands, right? So they've been on the internet their entire lives, um, which gives them that, uh, that acumen for technology. Uh, but also they've witnessed the internet and the social media that has come with it. And, uh, in addition to being more tech savvy, they are also more business savvy. They come understanding uh, entrepreneurism because they see it every day on the internet, right? Not necessarily through architecture where they see it as well, but everything is being monetized and everything could be a business and you can do a business anywhere in the world on, for anything. Um, and so they come with that mindset. And so I think that generation shift is a very positive one, but I definitely agree with you that there's some conflict, right? It's hard for the generation before me um, who did, had none of that to see this new way of doing it and trying to come up with a way that, that bridges those. It's a yeah, very interesting it, time. It is, you know, and it's, it's encouraging with the, the whole business side. It's the same thing. I see the same thing from my side, Mark, as I see that the young architects are starting their practice. They're, they're coming into it with the idea, not so much that I'm an architect running a business, but Hey, I'm, I'm, I gotta be a business person. I have to figure out this business thing and I'm doing it in the profession of architecture. Yeah. So they're already thinking about things like core values. They're already understanding that marketing is important. They're right. understanding that sales is important and branding is important. Yeah. And, and that's a complete flip-flop, right? That, that when we first started, we, that's why we started, right? That's why Entree Architect was launched. That's why Business of Architecture was launched to teach architects and to, to uh, convince them <laughs> that they're in business, that they are entrepreneurs, that they need to focus first on the business and then the successful firm comes after. Um, whereas today, what you're saying, today's generation, architects are coming as business first, understanding those fundamentals are important and then they're going to apply it to the thing that they love and, and want to practice. Yeah. And unfortunately, it just seems like, well, maybe not unfortunately, but it seems like the case with us as humans is that oftentimes change happens because of pressure or pain or unpleasant circumstances, as opposed to change happening simply for the joy of doing something different and innovating and taking risks because change is risky. 
Yes. I mean, I remember when TPO membranes first came, well, not when they first came out, but as they were being adopted for roofs and public commercial buildings, I know a lot of architects are like, we're not going to use that. We're not going to use that material. It's new. It's untested. We're going to use our old, you know, late, just our asphalt cement roofs. We're just going to keep on using those. Uh, you know, the felt underlayment with the tar on top and, you know, the six ply or whatever it is membrane, <laughs> you know, and it's like, because it's safe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's how change happens, right? Everybody thinks that they want change. They, they, they dream of change, right? They have the vision of what they want their firms to look like and what they want their lives to look like. But really you're right that the change doesn't happen until the pain is so painful that they have to make the change. It's very rare that you um, proactively make that change without feeling the discomfort first. Yeah, absolutely. I have a, I have a friend who's a, an entrepreneur who's led several successful businesses and he has a saying where he says, I'm all, and this, this was his pattern in the past. We said, I was always, I was always burn everything to the ground. And what he means by that is he would find out that he kind of reached this, this level of success in one area and then he couldn't, it kind of plateaued. It kind of reached the ultimate success there. And so he just destroyed it and built something bigger and it was different. It was bigger. Now, obviously he's, he looks back and says, I probably didn't need to destroy those things. But the one thing he did have was the ability to just go all in, just jump for it, make it happen, throw caution to the wind in a sense. And it served him well because let's face it, a lot of entrepreneurship is looking into the future and seeing um, that there's a pleasurable possibility there in front of us. Now, Mark, you said something that you said something that a lot of uh, firm owners, you know, kind of dream for uh, a better firm or have a dream what their firm looks like. Is that is that your experience? I would I want to question that. I'm yeah. not sure you're not experiencing I, that. You don't see. I'm that? I'm not sure that's the case. Well, I don't know. It's like because when I when I was laid off back in 2007 for the first time in the Great Recession, I just remember being at a at a stage in my life where I didn't know what the future held. You know, so it was difficult to have a dream. Like I had a very vague dream. I had like, I know I wanted things to be quote unquote better. Mm -hmm. I know I want to provide for my family better. I know I want to do work that I enjoyed, but what that would look like was just very, it was hard to pin down. It was difficult, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I'm curious, I'm curious. I think it's common for business owners. You're a very dr vision driven guy. I mean, I remember yes. back in 2012, you kind of had this picture of what Ancha Architect was going to look like. It was like amazing. You know, um, I feel, I feel that's a bit of a superpower for you. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I am, I do have that vision and it's, it, it is exactly what drives me. But I think for me, I think the architects that I talk to, um, they're very creative people, right? Many of them, I ask, I ask the question, you know, the origin story in most episodes and almost every episode, the architect explains that they knew they wanted to be an architect when they were young, right? M vast majority of architects decided they were going to be uh, an architect preteen, right? And so, um, and I think that creative uh, personality and sort of having the, the, um, the, the desire to become an architect, they have this vision of what an architect is and what it could be and what it should be in their mind, right? Very often, very un unrealistic. Uh, but the vision is there anyway, right? And so I think most architects, and I don't know if most architects, but the most architects that I talk to um, do have a, a dream of what they wished their firm would look like and would be. Um, what, I, what I agree with you uh, may be the case is that they don't document it, right? They don't, they don't do anything to achieve it. Right? They just have the dream. And then they just keep working and working and working, hoping that the dream will, will come. Um, and you and I both know that that doesn't work. There needs to be a, a, a framework. There needs to be a plan. There needs to be something that gets you from here to there. Yeah, I love that. I love that. The idea of a framework, powerful uh, framework is important because the cool thing about frameworks is frameworks are structures upon which change can still happen within them because any vision or any plan is going to need to zig and zag. It's going to need to change, mm -hmm. you know, as the market shifts, et cetera. So oftentimes when we set visions for our businesses, I mean, I was just talking with Ryan about this the other day. He was, we were talking about the vision that we have here at Business of Architect. And I said, well, we have a, a big audacious goal for where we want to get to in terms of revenue number, et cetera, like that. But the path to get there, I don't have a clue. 
you know, I have a big spreadsheet with a lot of ideas. And mostly what I can see is about a year in advance. I can say, okay, these are the steps we're going to kind of take in the next year or so. But beyond that, it's like the fog of war. You know, beyond that, who knows what's going to, like, there's so many variables that are going to happen. I remember hearing in business literature how the Japanese would like make hundred year business plans. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. But I mean, you, you, with that framework of sort of having the big audacious goals, um, you say you don't have a clue on how you're going to get there. So is your, is your practice just one year at a time? I, I have this big idea and I just need to hit this next year goal. And then next year I set another big goal and next year I hit another big goal. And that, is that how you do it? Yeah, generally the way that we practice planning, I've done it a lot of different ways, right? So typical business will be like, okay, you have your vision, which is way off. It's kind of maybe the unreachable goal that you may never reach. It's like the big inspiring thing. And as you know, typically three to five years for our listeners, this is like in kind of intermediate business planning right. books will tell you, you know, you have your three to five year plan. I don't have a three to five year plan. Yeah. I don't know what's going to look like in three to five years. I have a three to five year like like rough idea of where yeah. I want to be and things I'm passionate about, you know? So I really just focus on the big goal, which is off in the future. And then kind of the next, the next one to two years. Mm -hmm. So the most I really look out is like about two years, uh, in terms of the planning that we do. Now, having said that there's milestones along the way by like a certain amount of time we want to get here, but as it gets farther into the future, it's more, more vague about what it's going to look like. So That's what works for me. So do you set goals within the, within that one year vision? Do you set yeah, goals so, in order to achieve at a certain time? I need to do certain things in order to get to that goal in, in the year or yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what I found works out well is um, we've ditched quarterly planning. We ditched that a couple of years ago. We just do monthly now. So we every single month. So every single month we're uh, we're breaking down our 12 month plan. Our 12, we call it an impossible game. So we set an impossible game for the 12 months. And the reason why we call it an impossible game is because the it should be enough of a stretch so that reaching that reaching that achievement or that milestone is impossible based upon who we are right now at the moment. With with Meaning the that understanding we need to evolve. that you're you're going to need to make some changes in order to achieve that impossible goal. Yeah, and changes in ourselves, right. changes in our thinking, changes in our leadership, and then so based upon that. Then every single month we sit down, we sit down as a team and also I do it individually and our clients do it as well. We sit down and we look at what's the focus for this month that's going to take us closer to that, that, that milestone. And we also look at, we make sure we look at the four, what I call the four key areas of life. People divide this up differently. We call it body, being, balance, and business. So we look at fitness, physical fitness. We look at, um, that would be the body. We look at being, which is your connection with a higher power. If that's not for you, your internal certainty of what you represent, your confidence, um, your balance would be your relationships with people in your life. If you're a father, a mother, a, a spouse, if you have kids, setting goals in those areas. And then, of course, business, which there's a whole load of things there for financial. And it's it's fun. You know, as we bring in these like a holistic approach to goal setting, I was just talking with an architect the other day who's been in our program for a year. And he's like, he's like, I lost 22 pounds this year. I was like, 22 pounds. I'm like, yes, yes. You know, because oftentimes what we found, Mark, what I found is that a lot of times the business growth that I'm seeking for, I, 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 I can't, it's not necessarily going to happen if I just focus on the business because maybe there's some personality um, gap that I have in my leadership or the way I think about things, or the way I view the world, that if I just try to head on, try to go after that thing in business, it's not going to happen. But maybe if I try working on my marriage, then I'm going to discover, oh, Enoch, you know what? You're not that empathetic. You need to do a better job of listening to your wife so you can understand where she's coming from. And then once that clicks, then I'm like, oh, well, same thing happens in my business. You know what? I need to be listening to my team members, understanding what they care about, understanding how to recreate their world for them. So your smart practice method is that's included in all of that? Correct. Yeah. It's the planning framework that we use within the smart practice method is a, it's a system whereby we have a, a BHAG, we call it a summit map. So it's kind of creating like the big plan for the future and then general, general milestones along that, including like a five-year goal, a three-year goal, but those are just kind of revenue numbers and kind of products you want to work on. And then we look at the year and the year ones are the ones where we really sit down and say, okay, what are the really exciting things that I'm juiced about? 
you know? Yeah. And then halfway through the year, a lot of times with these goal setting exercises, well, we're reviewing it every single month. So it's cool because it doesn't slip, right? But then the other thing that you discover is you're doing this like just this monthly check-in. You're like, you know what? I had that on my list and um, I haven't been doing that. Like for instance, I've had like two years, Mark, I've had improving my flexibility in my my body, right? So my muscles. And it's like one of this is like, I want to be able to be more flexible in my groin because um, from sitting, I don't know whether it's COVID or whatever, but sitting at a desk all the time, yes. yep. it's like, I can feel it when I try to get in and out of a car, when I get up suddenly off the couch, you know, I'm like, I'm like, hold on a second, man, where's this youthful body I had? So yes. one of my, one of my goals is to, to increase my flexibility. And I have like, I want to be able to do, I think I want to be able to do like a side split with like six inches off the ground, you know, and that's been on my list for two years. And so I was like, okay, Enoch, I'm not taking the I'm not taking the actions that lead to that result. So I got to ask myself, do I really care about this? Is this real? Why am I not doing it? And so it's a good check in to see like what things do you care about. So we kind of adjust along the way as well. So what were the four pieces of the framework? So number one, your body, body. which is your fitness, your being, connection with self, yep. connection with the higher power, your balance would would be your partner. Uh, your romantic partner yeah. and your children primarily, and then other relationships in your life. And then your business, which is your finances, both personal and business finances as well. Yeah. I love that. I love that it's holistic and you're really looking at yeah. literally everything because they are all related, right? Like you said, it's very yes. hard to achieve your business goals if you're not healthy or that you have distractions in your marriage or, you know, your, your kids are not happy, right? The things in your business will suffer when those things are not working. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. And, and your stiff joints could be COVID, but it's also age, Enoch. <laughs> We've been doing Mark, this a long time. You had to time. break the news to me, man. You had to break the news to me. Dang it. <laughs> you mean there's a thing called age? <laughs> I read this book, by the way, by a guy named um, uh, Ron Zeller. Ron Zeller. What's the name of the book? Oh, it's got a, it's really fun, but actually the, he was, he was a guy that came out of, uh, he was, I don't know if you've heard of landmark. They do a lot of personal development stuff. Have you ever heard of the landmark training program? No. Okay. Well, Ron Zeller was a trainer for them. And what Ron Zeller, um, he wrote this book. He was like in his eighties, he did these incredible things. Like he ran a marathon and he became a Taekwondo champion. And he did all these really cool things that were like defying his age. And so he wrote this book. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, it's called Aging or Ageless. And actually in the book, he makes the case that aging is, is a cultural conditioning and it's a myth. Now, I'm not saying that that's true. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying it was a very interesting thought experiment. And uh, because like you, I look at my age, I look up every day in the mirror. I'm just thinking like, even yesterday, I was looking at some of the pictures and noticing some more wrinkles on my uh, I think we're getting handsomer here. though, Enoch. I think things- <laughs> I like it. I Thank things, you, Mark. <laughs> I think we're looking, if you look at our, our pictures 10 years ago, I think I look better than I did 10 years ago. Yeah. And, and you're same with you. Good. You're looking good, man. You're looking <laughs> good. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I, you know, we've come a long way and, uh, you know, I- I love the things that you're talking about. I love the holistic um, uh, approach that you're taking with your your training. Um, what does the future look like for you, specifically for you? I mean, we talked a little bit about goals, but like, where do you want to take business of architecture and, and the smart practice method um, and, and yourself personally, right? Holistically, where do you want to be in the next five years, 10 years? Yeah, beautiful. I mean, we, we continue to want to serve, serve our clients and serve architecture at the highest level. At business of architecture you know we just want to over deliver for people who come and join our program we want them to experience all the abundance that they can get in the world you know through their practice and here's here's the thing like architects are if you think about it architects are basically the stewards of our built environment absolutely like and 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 we look at that and construction professionals might disagree politicians might disagree but i mean like the creative aspect of the built environment, like, you know, it's like, like architects, I was talking with um, an architect who does a lot of very high end homes out in uh, where he used to live, but New York area, but he's like over in the Hamptons, that kind of area, yeah. right? And he said that nowadays, like he gave the example, he said, you know, I really try to convince my clients to do very high end mill work because these guys, these craftsmen who do the high end mill work, are, and it's been passed down for a hundred years or more 
of how they do this woodworking. And these guys are like real bona fide craftsmen. They're not the the day laborers who come in and, you know, the rough carpenters. Right. These are guys like doing the really cool stuff. And he said, they, um, their, their, their craft is dying or it's, it's under threat, shall we say? Yes. It's under threat, you know? And, um, like I get the conversation about, um, you know, that hope opens up a whole nother can of worms about like wealth and luxury. But what I do know is that oftentimes the wealthy elite and the luxury and the things they're able to invest in end up being able to help out the rest of society, right? Like, yep. like memory foam, NASA, you know, they're trying to figure out a good seat for the astronauts. Well, guess what? Now there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans who are sleeping a whole lot better on their memory foam mattresses. You know, it's like uh, the post-it note, you know, that whatever, they were trying to invent some glue, you know, and they came up with this like little post-it note that we use all over the place. So I really, I'm, I am confident and convinced that architects, number one, they need to rise up and really wake up to their value and their importance in society because architects go through design training in school. Uh, they go through the Beaux-Arts style training. They're trained about all the old traditional ways that architecture was done massing the way that spaces sit together like this is a craft and what ends up happening when when architects are under financial duress in other words when their businesses are difficult they're not making enough money yeah. then what ends up happening is the industry gets under threat right so people end up leaving the industry uh it's harder to find good qualified people and then we have we have a brain drain so we have ai coming on what's i mean there's so many Radical change is happening. We really need architects who are bold, number one, and they understand the value that they have, and they're willing to stand for it in a radical way in the face of other people who are telling them that, you know, you're not valuable, or we can do this this way, or this AI program could replicate what you do. These are the kind of battles that architects are going to have to take a stand for. Right. So, so that's important. Are you optimistic about the future of architecture? Oh, I'm so optimistic. I'm so optimistic. Yes, absolutely. What does the profession so look like in, in five years from now with AI and all oh, the things geez. that are happening? Yeah. I mean, great question. <laughs> it's like, it's like AI is just, as you know, incredible. So, I mean, I, I was talking to, I can't remember. I heard this from a friend or someone. He said, Hey, look, you know, here's the truth about AI. He's all the people who are going to, there's going to be two kinds of people in the future. There's going to be the people who learn how to work with AI and harness it and become the, 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 um, the curators of it. Right. And there's going to be the people who don't. That's right. And the people who become the curators of it and understand how to use it are going to, they're going to set the conversation for the next 10, 15, 20 years. That's, I can't see it how it turned out any other way. Yeah. So do you think architects will do that? Do you think they will embrace AI and become the leaders of AI and technology? Some will, some will. Yeah. And I think others will, it's interesting, you know, others will come from outside. So you look at some of the, look at some of the companies now coming in from AI, they're coming from the tech space. Right. And it's like, it's like either architects rise and do this and get involved in this. And it'll probably be the younger architects because they're looking for a career path and they might get pulled into an AI company. But I, it's, it's got, it, it's got to happen. You know, because we don't want that, we don't want that brain drain to happen. Yeah. And uh, we don't want to lose that. What you were saying about other industries and technology, that's a big threat, right? Those, those industries yeah. and that technology can take over, right? And take our mm -hmm. profession away and, yeah. and could make architects obsolete unless yeah. architects embrace it and lead it and become the stewards of it. And I think the generation yeah. that we were talking about earlier that are the younger generation that are coming in native technology and business will fully embrace that and will expect it and will, will, will save the profession. Um, absolutely. The next generation will, will thrive in this new, in this new world. Agreed. So there's, you know, when we look at AI, it's easy to, well, not just AI, but just the world in general, geopolitical changes, crazy politicians in office who are doing just crazy things and seem to be out of touch with like humanity in general. You know, it seems there's co corruption happening and, you know, I don't watch the news anymore, but it just seems like a continual, he said, she said kind of battle fest between, yeah. between politics, et cetera. Um, and, and so it's like, yeah, the government's not going to save us. No. You know, it's not going to save us. We're the everyday man and woman's going to have to rise up and say, when I say rise up, I mean, just start being more vocal. There's, there's gotta be, 
There's got to be um, people with values standing up and saying we've had enough. Yeah. And same thing goes for architecture. Yeah, I think there's such an opportunity for leadership, both you know, in architecture and in our country. Um, if somebody just stood up and started telling the truth and telling, saying the right, the things that need to be said, both in architecture and in our country, um, I think the country will will rally behind them. Um, I I think that the profession would rally behind them, um, and so. I think it's just a matter of having some strong leaders. Uh, I think generationally, I think from a, from a, that same generation, I think will also save the country, right? I think this next younger generation will live through this mess that we're in and say, we're not doing it like that. We're not going to, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to do it differently. Yeah. I mean, there has to be a, there has to be a, just a, a converse, uh, just a, a shift in consciousness and, you know, hopefully it won't happen because of pain. Like we talked yeah. about earlier. Yeah. That's, and I was that's down in the Amazon fear, right? a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, as I was down there, I was in Peru in the Amazon and, you know, I, I was kind of taken back. I was taken back to the way that, that we used to live, uh, in this country before we were super developed, you know, um, you know, people living off the land. Um, and, and there was just a certain, you know, I, I felt a certain like gratitude for being given a glimpse of that way of lifestyle yeah. where people aren't so separate in suburban homes that everyone has an 8,000 square foot lot and you never see your neighbors. And it's like from doorstep to doorstep to go work in a corporate cubicle somewhere. And there's just feels like there's a sense of humanity that is, uh, that, that, that's, that's missing from modern life. And we're shifting, we're shifting over. I can see, I can see the United States and just, you know, the consciousness of communities shifting over. Um, but it's, it's a wild ride. Yes. Mark, and it's uh, we have so many tools available, like the internet and AI, to uh, to help all of us be more prosperous. Yeah, well, I think people like you who have dedicated their lives to helping others grow and prosper um, is a big way that the the future will will succeed, right? That the profession will grow, our world will grow, um, because I think not only the people who interact with you benefit from you. But all of the people who interact with those people benefit from the work that you do. Uh, and so, first of all, thank you. Thank you for doing the work that you, you, you have done for the past decade uh, and continue to do at a very high level. Um, thank you for leading the way and showing many architects how to do it. Thanks, Mark. And I would, I would like to you know, just speak to your audience and my audience as well, because we'll put this on my podcast. Yeah. and just really inspire them for what's possible, you know, because the reason why someone will listen to this podcast is because they know there's something better for them inside. They know that they have some contribution to make to the overall con conversation uh, in the world or, you know, around these things that we're talking about for the future. So, you know, Ryan, my business partner, he came to business of architecture because he was motivated by the podcast and and he and I know you have people in your world the same way where they listen and they're inspired, yeah. And and you help them connect with something inside of themselves that kind of blossoms into a new level of leadership. So I want to, you know, just inspire our our listeners to say that yes, architecture is changing. Yes, technology is changing. It's going to change at light speed. And uh, don't worry about it. Don't 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 stress out about it. Do what do what you know. Put your shoulder to the wheel. Like have belief, have faith, follow, follow your dreams. Yeah. And just follow your heart. Take, take the next best step, right? It's so easy yeah. to get overwhelmed yeah. with the vision mm -hmm. and all the things that we need to do. And really all you can do is the next best thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, thank you for Mark. I want to, I want to ask yeah. you, um, uh, what, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your approach to rest? So right now with the, you know, internet and everything, there's a lot of hustle and grind culture. When you tune into all the entrepreneurial world, it's like, there's so many videos. Like I love Les Brown. I love Tony Robbins. Like I love, I just love listening. They're great. Yep. You know, I love it. But a lot of times the message is like, when you're tired, keep pushing harder. Don't stop. You know, go to the top of the mountain. When you reach that mountain, go to the next mountain. Yeah. And um, I'm curious, you know, where do you land with that? Like rest, hustle and grind. What's, what's your philosophy around yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question, Enoch. <laughs> I know. My I um, I am working hard. Um, 
I'm very focused on big goals. Um, I do work out and I do my best to rest. Uh, much of the, because of the big goals that I have and the choices that I've made in order to achieve the big goals that I have, um, there's a lot of stress, right? So, uh, and that stress keeps me from resting how I should. Um, and that's not a good thing, right? Wouldn't want anybody else to, to experience what I'm experiencing in terms of my rest. Um, but it's a very interesting question that you ask because I struggle with that quite a bit. Um, and so, uh, it's something that I, I work hard at and, uh, and really, um, I think it, it will take, uh, achieving some of these goals that I have in order for me to get to the point where, uh, I can rest more. Why do you want to achieve the goals? Why not just rest now? Yeah. I, the goals that I have set are, aren't, are not only for me. Um, the goals I have set are, are for others. Um, I'm intentionally, or you said earlier that I, I had very big vision, uh, early on. Well, I still have a very, very big vision. Um, an entree architect will survive me. It is being designed and being grown to, to change the world through architecture. Um, and, and to continue when I'm not part of it anymore. Uh, and that's a very big decision, right? That's a very big role to, to play. Um, and so if I didn't reach for those goals and I, I stopped and just took the, took the break, uh, and rested, um, I don't think I'd get to where I need to be and where I want to be, let's say where I want to be. Um, I feel a calling much like you do. Um, I feel a purpose. I'm driven by things that aren't in my control. Uh, I really feel that what I do is, is God, uh, that, that God has spoken to me and has moved me in the direction that I'm going. Um, and every day I just stay on the path and keep moving forward. And so, uh, I don't think I can stop. Beautiful. I mean, there's that, that's it. Like that's, that's a calling, you know, when you feel the calling and you, you touch in with whatever your calling is, uh, it is, I found as well that it's, it's like a fire that can't be extinguished. Yeah. Very you much can so. run like Jonah, but you might end up spit up on the beach again somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, it's a very big vision and you have a very big vision too. Um, and we've come a long way in the last 10 years. Uh, and in my, in my, and I'm sure you you have a very similar thought from what you've shared here today. Um, I have just begun the last 10 years is literally the foundation for what I have planned for the future. Uh, and so that's why I work as hard as I do. I, I, I'm getting older, right? I'm 54 years old. Uh, the big vision takes time and I need to accomplish certain things by certain times in order for them to happen in order for me to get this to where I want it to be, uh, before I'm too old to do it. And so, uh, every day I get up and keep doing it. Beautiful. So I, that was a very deep conversation. And so I'm, 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 I am questioning whether I should ask you the final question that I typically ask my guests, but I would love to have you answer the question. Um, what's one thing that an architect can do to build a better business for tomorrow? Great question. What's the one thing they should do right now, today? If they were going to just do one thing, what's the one thing? Give themselves permission to want more than they have right now. That is a great answer. That is a great answer. His name is Enix Sears. Business of Architecture is his platform. Go visit businessofarchitecture.com. Learn about what they're doing over there with the smart practice method. Um, subscribe to the podcast. Reach out and say that you've uh, you've heard Enoch on this podcast. You're inspired and, uh, and you want to learn more. So businessofarchitecture.com. Enoch, thanks again for 
doing what you do, what you've done. And, uh, and thanks for coming by here today at Entre Architect Podcast. Mark, thanks for having me. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.